aptly described in the following way. They're neither life, alive nor dead, yet both alive and dead at the same time. So they're neither wholly alive nor wholly dead, but they are both alive and dead at the same time. They are sort of occupy this very ambiguous status by our lights. And I should emphasize, I guess, the ambiguity is our, our problem. I'm not sure they think about things in terms of ambiguity. So there, I mean, you can also, and these, these the enomics pretty much align with one another, like um, hot aligns with male, cold aligns with female, wet aligns with female and cold, hot, dry align with male. So all these enomics end up sort of lining with one another. Gender is part of it, but it's not the whole, whole part of it. Um, and it turns out that everything is interrelated in these ways. And uh, you and I are all interrelated. I can have, and things are very flux, I can have a various a match. For example, as, uh, as, the, my, as a man of the house, I'm sort of an, a male related to my wife, who is a female, a female enamic. Let's see. If I'm, let's see, if I'm from Tlaxcala and I'm a warrior who goes to battle with the Tenocha, the Aztecs, I am now a female because the Aztecs view alien warriors as female. So I'm both male and female, male in my house, yet female vis-a-vis -vis or relative to the Tenocha warrior, the Mexica warrior who I meet in the, on the battlefield. So everything is ambiguous in this way and everything, I can both be male and female at the same time depending upon my particular match. And I'm interrelated with everything, so I'm sort of exhaustively right, defined in this way. Here's a, 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 a picture from a, a pictoglyph from the Codex. Um, my brain's not working. I can't remember the Codex. But here you have on your right, you have Quetzalcoatl. Um, and on the left is Miklantecutli. Lord of the Underworld, or Death God, if we want to talk about that. But I mean, Miklan means death, and Tekutli just means Lord or Honorable. So here you have life and death, and they're joined at the spine. And one of the words, if you go into Molina, Molina's dictionary, um, one of the uses of enomics is for two fields to come back to back and share a wall in common. So in this way, I think they're trying to, you know, portray, depict, convey the idea of this enomic, agonistic enomic duality, that these things are linked together by the spine. They share a common backbone. Oftentimes they're, they're um, depicted facing one another, and that's a very other common motif for depicting enomics, face to face. Um, husbands and wives are commonly depicted facing one another in the codices. Do I have any more of these? No. Okay, let's see. So at the very bottom, we've got the following are, are are not included in these enomics. One, good and evil. So central to Western religion and metaphysics, this notion of good and evil, they're just not there. They're arranged things and they're malarranged things. They're ordered things and disordered things, but there is no such thing as goodness or evil as such. They're just not part of their worldview, how their horizon. That's a big difference. Um, because, I mean, death isn't good and death isn't evil. Right? Death is both good and bad, right? For at least from a human point of view, we don't want to die, but also we need it because we got to eat. Okay, balance and imbalance aren't enamics. Balance is the tertium quid like becoming, and it's between two imbalances. Balance is this dynamic notion, unlike, um, I think, at least in one way of interpreting. Greek, the Greek, the Greek notion of the mean is that it's a static in the middle. If you think about the hitting the right note, if you think about courage as in be, being in between cowardice and foolhardiness, there's a, there's a jeep sort of mathematically defined middle point which you try to hit. Or sharp note, flat note, you try to get the note right on. The Aztecs have this notion of a middle, but it's dynamically defined in keeping with the process metaphysics. And the balance is pretty much, I'm going to go out of, I'm going to go out of listening range here. Think about how you walk or riding, well I won't. Think about riding a bike. You're always going like this, right? You're never just going like this. Nobody can ride a bike like that. You're always oh, a little that, and then if you go this way, you over, you correct this way. You, when, you, when you swerve this way, you don't go straight up. You have to go this way. And so the balance that you get is this dynamic, diachronic, 
pro, um, achievement of going back like this and that. So it's like walking, which is the same thing. I mean, if you look at walking, you're going like this. You're going, Why? I'm out of balance, out of balance, out of balance, out of balance, out of balance. But the overall process is walking in balance. So this is going to be key because if we ever get there, right, the notion, they have this notion of walking on the surface of the earth, and the key is to walk in balance. And the balance has to be this diachronic, dynamic process where you go this way, we all do, and then, but then you, over, you correct by going this way. And you're, oh, we're always going like this through life, trying to maintain our balance on what they describe in the Florentine Codex as the very slippery earth. So center and periphery are not opposites or enomics. The center is the middle of the periphery, right? There are two peripheries and there's a center in the middle, just as there's non-being, being, and becoming imbalanced this way, imbalanced this way, and balance. And so, okay, have I exhausted all of this? I think so. Aren't these masks lovely? I don't these are all in the Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City. Okay, so we've got an agonistic enamic unity. These things are always going on. So, how's my time? You have, you have about um, 15 more. Okay, uh, we have three different sort of patterns of transformation. I say motion change because like the Greeks, physical change in attributes is a kind of motion for the Aztecs. Right, modern people, Westerners think of motion as simply physical, you know, a motion from place, one place to another. But if I change, get a haircut, do something, that is movement, that is motion. So I'm hyphenating those, turning into motion change. And the cosmos is run by these three patterns. You've got sacred energy and agonistic and forces circulate throughout the cosmos in three principal ways. There's Olin, Malanali, and Nepantla. These constitute three different patterns of ways of ordering or kinds of motion change, becoming, processing, and a big blob there, transformation. And all transformation is creative, destructive, and destructive, creative. In order to transform, something is created, but something's always destroyed. And something, in destroying something, you're always creating something. They're not three different kinds of energies, they're just different ways of ordering energy. So the first one is called Olin. It's a four-stage pulsating, undulating, oscillating, and centering motion. It's paradigmatically illustrated by a, the beating heart. Boom, 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 boom. It has four stages. It's this undulating. And the olin comes from, uh, boy, is it Maya Ole, from which Spanish oi, right, comes for rubber, and it comes from the sap of that rubber tree. And so this notion that you get the words for a rubber ball has to do, has an olin rote, and olin is this general kind of motion. It's this bouncing ball, up, boing, 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 yeah? It's undulating, it's oscillating, and the paradigmatic example is the human heart beating, okay? It has a center, and it also, it has four stages. It's also exhibited by a respiring chest, by earthquakes, by labor contractions, by the ball in the Mesoamerican ball game going back and forth, and it's also exhibited by the motion of the sun every day. It oscillates over the sky, right? If you think about the sun, it goes like this. From the, right, from the very, to, to winter to summer, uh, um, to winter to summer solstices, right? It's going like this, mm -hmm. changes every time. So you've got this undulated and, and, and un oscillating going on with the sun. The kind of change I call it is horizontal change. That'll become clear why in a minute. Motion change of a fourfold cyclical completion and transformation within a cycle. Everything that is alive in the fifth age has four cycles or four, I mean, four stages. For human beings, it can be infancy, childhood, young adulthood, old age slash death. Everything that is alive has these stages. Mountains, rocks, cities, cotton, chairs. Because everything's alive, and everything that alive is defined in the fifth age by olin. Olin is the essence, or what they say, the heart. It's the biorhythm of the fifth sun, the fifth age, and all inhabitants of the fifth age. Everything moves in this pattern. It defines the life cycle, or the life-death cycle of everything. 
So we've got Olin figures, I'll show you, convey the concept of Olin. They depict the arrangement of time, place, and the existence of the fifth age and the fifth age itself. Here's one of my favorites, the four-petaled flower with a center, right? This depicts Olin motion change. It depicts and it conveys the concept of four-staged cyclical, right, undulating motion. It's got a center, which is very important because I mean, it's got this notion of being well-centered. So this motion creates a center and it goes around a center. The motion of your heart, the motion of the sun. So this, right, depicts all of that. It gives you the concept of Olin, and it also is a symbol of the fifth age because this is what our world right now is all about. That says it all. Um, here's the ball court. It also has this sort of fourfold shape. People call the the four-petaled flower here, a quincunx, it's got four flanges and a center. This one, the, the, the center isn't as obvious, but this is from the Codex Borgia. Here we've got a, another picture uh, from the Codex Borgia of the new fire ceremony. We've got the, the Maltese, I think that's a Maltese cross, we call, which is a quincunx, which is the right paradigmatic a, a symbol of the fifth age. Um, I'll return to this one too. Here's a game called Patoli, which people liken to Parcheesi. And it also, right, in playing the game, one imitates the passage of the sun each year. And people try to win and gamble, and they lose themselves into slavery. Um, here's another symbol for Olin. Uh, is this one better there? We've got the famous calendar stone at the center of the calendar stone. We've got the Olin glyph, the Olin figure, with Tonatihua. Um, at the center, the sun in the center, and you've got the four, four stages of the cosmos, but it's at the center of the calendar stone is Olin motion change. Here's the one that's drawn a little bit more clearly. Um, there's another common glyph. Here's another com common way of portraying it. This is page one from a codex, the hair very mayor, in which this is sort of a cosmogram, a picture of the structure of space and the structure of time. It depicts how time works. At top is east on Mesoamerican maps, so to speak. East is always on top because that's where the sun rises. East is on the top and then the sun moves counterclockwise from east, north, west, south. And this is a depiction of the structure of space-time, or time place, as I prefer to call it, because space is not that abstract. And time and place are fused. East is a time place. It's a place in a time where something happens. And it's defined it's as that where the sun rises. The Nahuatl word for east is that is that place from which the sun rises. And west is simply where the sun sets. So the geo northwest, east, south aren't permanent compass markings in the structure of space time. They are where things happen. Here's an, uh, another very commonly seen one from the Codex Mendoza, a post-conquest manuscript. And at the center, you've got Tenochtitlan, the uh, capital city of, uh, of the Aztecs. But they're in the center of this Olin glyph. OK, number two kind of motion change, Malinali. It's the motion change involved in twisting, spinning, gyrating, coiling, and single and double spiraling. It's involved in spinning fiber into thread. It's involved in speaking, eating, digesting, blowing life into things to give them breath, blowing into musical instruments to create music, drilling fire, burning things, burning incense, dancing, and it's very important in heart sacrifice. So there's this idea that by spinning and twisting things, they become ordered. So let's see. That pretty much doesn't fit with ordinary English discourse. We've got this note. Isn't there like a heavy metal band named Twisted Sister? And if you call someone, hey, dude, you're twisted, it's you know like you're kind of weird and screwed up to call someone twisted. For the Aztecs to be twisted is good because it means you've been properly ordered. Think about that raw cotton. You get this raw bowl of cotton, and it's disorderly, and it's chaotic and dirty. You clean it, and then you spin it, and you spin it and in spinning it and gyrating it and helicoidally gyrating it, you turn it into three maps, so to speak. East is always on top because that's where the sun rises. East is on the top and then the sun moves counterclockwise from east, north, west, south. And this is a depiction of the structure of space-time or 
time place, as I prefer to call it, because space is not that abstract. And time and place are fused. East is a time place. It's a place and a time where something happens. And it's defined as that where the sun rises. The Nahuatl word for east is that is that place from which the sun rises. And west is simply where the sun sets. So the geo northwest, east, south aren't permanent compass markings in the structure of space time. They are where things happen. Here's an, uh, another very commonly seen one from the Codex Mendoza, a post conquest manuscript. And at the center, you've got Tenochtitlan, the uh, capital city of, uh, of the Aztecs. But they're in the center of this Olin glyph. OK, number two kind of motion change, Malinali. It's the motion change involved in twisting, spinning, gyrating, coiling, and single and double spiraling. It's involved in spinning fiber into thread. It's involved in speaking, eating, digesting, blowing life into things to give them breath, blowing into musical instruments to create music, drilling fire, burning things, burning incense, dancing, and it's very important in heart sacrifice. So there's this idea that by spinning and twisting things, they become ordered. So let's see. That pretty much doesn't fit with ordinary English discourse. We've got this note. Isn't there like a heavy metal band named Twisted Sister? And if you call someone, hey, dude, you're twisted, it's you know, like you're kind of weird and screwed up to call someone twisted. For the Aztecs to be twisted is good because it means you've been properly ordered. Think about that raw cotton. You get this raw bowl of cotton, and it's disorderly, and it's chaotic and dirty. You clean it, and then you spin it. And you spin it, and in spinning it, and gyrating it, and helicoidally gyrating it, you turn it into thread. You order it, and you turn it into something useful. And then, of course, you weave it into fabric. But twisting is a good thing, and it's an essential part of transmitting energy between the cosmos. So it's motion change involved in energy transmission between Olin-defined life-death cycles, between the vertical layers of the cosmos and between different stages in the Olin-defined life-death cycles of the things. So even cotton, raw cotton, has this four stages. If I want to feed the cosmos, one of the essential things about heart sacrifice has to do with nourishing and feeding and basically giving a blood transfusion to various parts of the cosmos. A lot of the people sacrifice to the sun. All of that involves getting their blood, twisting it, spinning it in the right sort of way so that you can s transmute it, trans convey it to the sun and give the blood, the sun, an energy transfusion. So eating involves this. Cooking and digesting are all twisted. They occur in the stomach. The intestines are twisted. And fire is twisted. And all of these, so by twisting things, you prepare energy for transmission to some other thing, to knee feed it, to nourish it. So Malinali actually plays probably the largest role in all Aztec rituals, because most Aztec rituals are all devoted to feeding Tlaloc, feeding the sun, keeping this cosmic thing going because it needs to be nourished. It's part of our job as human beings. Ay, ay, ay. OK. Here's a, a called the atlachinoli. There's the word on the bottom. It means water, fire, burnt things. It combines water and fire, and it's a symbol of the fifth age. Here's another one, right? This notion of spinning and coiling. These are symbols of transformation and transmutation. Another one. Here, the, the center one's called the Shikal Kolehuiki, and then you've got some spirals. They're all symbols of transformation. Here's the bottom of a sculptural depiction of Quetzalcoatl. You see this coiling, and Quetzalcoatl's all about transformation. Um, you've got the Shikal Kolehuiki on the bottom left again. You have a beautiful uh, uh, shield from the Museum of Anthropology. Right? By having a shield in the battlefield, you're pretty much declaring yourself to be an agent of transformation. I'm going to get you, and I'm going to transfuse your blood to the, God, to the sun. Pretty scary stuff. Here's an offering from the Temple of Mayor. You have a spiral. And then in the middle, the two twists, or olin. Um, and here's a post-conquest ceramic disc where Malanali has been in service of there's a crucifix on top of a pyramid. And if you know your history right, the Spaniards commonly lopped off the tops of pyramids and put churches on top. OK, Nepantla, the one I want to get to, is this mutually reciprocating back and forth betwixt and betweening middling and balancing motion change. 
and it's typified by most dramatically by weaving and by sexual commingling. By sexual commingling and weaving, you're always bringing together two anomics and forming a third thing out of them. Okay, and it's ne the cosmos and defined in terms of nepantla motion change. Nepantla, we'll talk about it later maybe, is not the same as liminality in the way that Victor Turner, Gloria Anzaldúr, Mignola, all these other people in border study are talking about. It's not liminality. It's something very different. So the cosmos is all in nepantla. So you've got this going back and forth and weaving together of things. There we have Nepantla. Tenochtitlan is in the middle of the crossroads. It's where you want to be. It's being well-centered and well-middled. Here you go. The center is where you want to be. You've got a crossroads again. Once again, you've got a crossroads. Once again, you've got crossroads. Uh, well, these are various ways of ordering people's energies before you dispatch them. Okay. <laughs> So Teot is, one of the ways of talking about Teot is this, or is Ome Teot, and there are a variety of different ways in the, co in, the, in the sources. But it all has to do with, the Ome Teot is basically two deity, or two sacred energy, and Teot resides in this place called Ome Yokan, which is time place of duality. And it's a place of constant weaving, or a place of constant sexual commingling. Ome Teot is this male, fi female figure who is engaged in never-ending sex with itself. It is sexual activity. It is sexual commingling. And weaving is also like, I mean, sexual commingling is a, a directly parallel with weaving. Weavers are very sexually charged people. And weaving is the bringing together of two things and forming something else. So here's how it works. Here's a backstrap weaver. You've got the warp and the weft, right? Here's my own drawing. Did it come out? Yep, OK. Here's a backstrap. Loom, maybe we can. Here's how the cosmos gets woven. You start out from the top, and you have the, the Malanali forces are vertical, and they come down like this from the heavens and come up from the below the earth. And the sun is the weft, and it goes back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth like this. It is right with a shuttlecock going like this, or with the bobbin going like this, in between the Malanali warp fibers. And all the description of all the weaving utensils are all gendered male or female, and they're all either keyed to Olin or Malanali, right? The activity of the cock going up and down is said a little boat that bobs. And the under boat that bobs, it's an Olin-related word. So you've got the sun is actually weaving the cosmos, right? With these, the warp fibers are coming down. There are the sacred calendars, and this energy is coming down. And then the sun weaves it together like this and creates the fabric of the cosmos of the fifth age. Um, the layers are pretty much folds in a unified cloth. The word for the counter uh, verb for counting layers of the cosmos in Nahuatl, there are different count um, nouns or verbs. And this one is um, confined to counting things which are, can be stacked on top of one another, like folded blankets, like tortillas, like sandals. They're with the one and the same thing that you stack on top, but they're not different kinds of things. And this is closely modeled. Um, there's a wonderful book by Cordry and Cordry, which has a whole page of these, how Mesoamerican women fold their skirts because they're very, very too long for them. So they wrap them around themselves. And here you have these folds in a skirt um, and it pretty much looks like that. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I guess I probably made it in time. Yeah, you did. Okay. Thank you. Well, sure. <laughs>